You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Hongyi, I'm super excited for today's episode. Thank you for flying all the way in to, from Singapore for this episode. I know it's specific for this and no other business meetings or anything like that. <laughs> and we also have a live studio audience today. Let's, let's, let's hear it from the studio audience. All right, all right. In post, we, we, we won't edit that at all. All right. But uh, Hongyi. I'm really excited to start this this episode, but before going deep into the questions, can you give our audience a brief background of your career up until this point? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah, so uh, basically came to, came to college in the States. I studied economics and computer science uh, um, in college. Uh, then originally, like, originally I, I, I came just to do econ, but I think like somewhere around my like soft, like sophomore, junior year, like when I started like looking into other things to do and like ended up doing some C, um, CS. Um, I, I originally, I was just going to go straight back to Singapore. Um, but uh, I, one of my friends convinced me to like, you know, apply for an internship at Google. And so I ended up interning there for a summer. I was a product manager on the Android team. Um, we were working on two things. What uh, I think what, and we worked on what would many years later end up becoming like Google, um, Google Keep and, uh, and the Android Play Store basically. Um, so yeah. Uh, and so after that I was like, oh wow, like, you know, I'm just this kid who barely knows anything, but like, you know, this, the, the stuff that like, the stuff that I have input on actually goes out to like millions of people all around the world. This, 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 that's sort of like what convinced me that like, there's probably something like worth doing in tech. Um, and so after graduating, uh, I joined Google for a couple of years as a product manager. Um, I started, uh, I started out on the infrastructure team. Uh, we worked on like distributed databases, uh, Spanner, if you know what it is, basically it's Google's like, you know, like both very scalable as well as like SQL sort of like uh, database. Um, and then I worked, I moved on to work on image search uh, when image search, you know, if you go Google and you search for images, you know, now, now, nowadays you can see that when you, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of like related images when you ever look at a single image and there's a whole bunch of sort of like different categories at the top of the page. Um, and like, you, you know, when you click on an image, you don't have to go to a different page anymore. You see it like, you know, you just have the image show big on the same screen. Like that's, that's this kind of stuff we were working on. Um, and then after that, I, I went back to, so after a couple of years in the Valley, um, I went back to, I went back to Singapore, uh, joined the Singapore government. Um, and I've been there for the last, like basically, basically like nine years now, I think. Um, and let's see, yeah, I think for the first. For the first few years, in, in, when I was back in Singapore, I I wasn't exactly sure what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> you know, you come from Google, you build tech, you go, and, and the government's very different. Uh, and so for the first few years, I was trying to like do some projects here and there, but like, I, I think just like the norms of like whether or not to initiate a new project is very, very different. Um, but somewhere around my like third or fourth year, I think uh, basically like we got a little bit of funding uh, and like we managed to stop, like I managed to like put together a small team. Um, and we started working on data.gov. Uh, data.gov is Singapore's like, um, how do you describe this? It's, it's, our, it's our data sharing portal. So I think that you know, the US is a data.gov as well. So we have data.gov.sg. It's an open data sharing platform for the Singapore government and the, to share data with the public and between government agencies. Um, from there, our team sort of like started bootstrapping and working some other projects. And so we started like, you know, as a sort of, you know, skunk works kind of thing. We would build like some side projects and you know, a lot of them didn't go anywhere, but like, a couple which caught on were like uh, Parking SG, which was a, it, it's an app to pay for street parking. So in Singapore, you know, you park on the side of the street, you got to pay for it. Normally you have to use either like, you know, in the US you have meters. In Singapore, we have like coupons you got to buy. Um, and we replaced that with an app. Um, we built Form SG, which is like, it's a bit like Google Forms, but for, but for government. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot, government is very famous for having a lot of paper forms. And the idea was to just, we need to get rid of all of those. And so we built Form SG, which was a form building tool. Um, and then we built like a couple others Like we built like, you know, a website building tool. We built like a link shortener and things like that. Um, and I think from there, the team just sort of grew. Um, at some point we, we split out like a bit officially. And so I think about three years ago, we, uh, they, the team had had some success with some of our initial products. We weren't really big or anything yet. Just had you know, a handful of users here and there. Um, but basically I, I think I came to like the conclusion that like, it was going to be really, really hard to sort of, have a successful sort of tech initiative in the Singapore government um, if we didn't have like some change in how, you know, I guess in how the organization was structured. Uh, so we put together, so myself and the rest of the team, we put together this like joint proposal 
basically on like, hey, why don't you just like split us out? And like, you know, you, you don't have to, tra- you don't, you know, it's, it's really hard for the government to change all the rules all at once. But basically what we said was like, we're a pretty small team. If you just give us a bit of money and, and like give us a couple of exemptions from like, you know, these couple of rules here and there, we should be able to build uh, tech products, which are like, you know, more effective, uh, like more secure and cheaper and faster than, you know, than, than you would normally do in the government. Um, basically, like my theory was that I had seen how tech companies were organized differently. And like, if I could use that to build a team, um, then I think I thought we could have a more effective team in the government. And so that was three years ago. Um, we started out at like 30 or so people. Um, as of by the end of this year, we're going to be at about, about 120. Um, so yeah, the, the team's been pretty successful, we launched a whole bunch of different things. Most recently we built, uh, things like, like most recently we built like the vaccination, um, sort of like the vaccination portal for, for the public. So, you know, we have the, all, all 5 million people vaccinated or whatever, you know, it, we built a website that, you know, <laughs> to do all that. Um, and yeah, and I think maybe on a sort of lighter note, we built, a, we built another, we built a tool for the government basically to make it easier for the government to give out money. Um, so it's called Redeem SG. The idea here is that like, you know, the government actually quite often wants to distribute vouchers and stuff to the public, but distributing this money is actually really, really hard. Uh, and so we built a very simple sort of like, you know, digital voucher tool where, you know, basically the government would just say, say I want to give all households or all individuals or whatever, like, you know, $50, $100 to spend at these places. And like, you just, you'll get a, you get an SMS and like, you have a link to the voucher and then you can just like, you know, scan the QR code and whatever, and the merchant scanning it will get their money. And so that's, that's, you know, another example of, of, of one of the things that we've built. Um, but yeah, that, that brings us more or less to today, um, where, where we're sort of running this team and like, you know, trying to, trying to scale it further. Okay. So what were some of the lessons that you took away from your time at Google that you've implemented in the government or how you you touched on it a little bit but can you go a little bit deeper of how those two worlds are so different yeah yeah absolutely um so like i think the biggest thing that struck me when i came from like you know google in back into the singapore government was that was the sort of like general philosophy of how you run the run the organization at google it was very empowering Basically, the idea is that, you know, you join Google and you're just this kid out of school, but like you have access to like, you know, UX researchers and like data scientists and like, you know, you, you have you have A-B testing infrastructure, which lets you like, you know, try a new change out on like a million people and get like really detailed feedback on it. And like you work with engineers who can like prototype stuff really quickly. And like, you know, you felt like, all right, you know, as part of this organization, I could do a lot. Well, at least a lot more than I could do individually. In the government, when I, but when I came back to the government, it felt very... It was, it was much more, it's a much more constrained environment, you know, like, um, you know, I mean, yes, you, on, on your own, you could like, you know, you could, you, you could, you could build an app, but like you have to do it part of the government. You have to like, you know, you have to write the, you have to write basically a submission. You have to clear that through your boss and he has to clear it through his boss and like through several levels deep before you can build anything. Um, in order to just like buy a laptop, for example, it takes like a couple of months in order to like put up the funding paper and like get the procurement uh, process done. And then you get it shipped over. It takes like, you know, the two, three months to just, to even just get a laptop. Um, and like, you know, because, and, and the reason for all that is not because they want people to be less, empower, they want people to be less effective, but it's because for government, the primary goal is that they have a thing that they want to do and you want to make sure that, you, and, and it's important that people are, so, so that there's sufficient, I guess, oversight and like process followed in order to achieve that thing. So you don't have people just running around, you know, like wasting public taxpayer money. Um, and the side effect of that is that like the individuals get very disempowered, like as an individual, you are net less, like, like you feel like you, you can do less as part of your organization than you could on your own. Um, but conversely, I think what's really interesting is that the order of magnitude of the problems is also reversed, where like at Google, you know, you, you do all this work, you have UX designers, you have like, you know, you, 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 have, you have these like really brilliant teams of engineers and you like run tests for months and you, you, know, you, 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 you like tune, you tune your product to within an inch of its life. And like that product is like, you know, should we like, you know, what color your ads should be when you float flash. And this has like, you know, like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of revenue impact. Or like when you're showing like thumbnails for your images, right? Then you test like small, medium, large, and like, you know, the size sizes in between, you test like different algorithms for like laying out images on a page. Um, and it's all really sophisticated, but at the end of the day, you know, like the difference it can make is like in the scale of society is pretty marginal. Whereas what I found is that you're working in the government, like, you know, you'll be, you'll be making decisions on like, for example, like where the new bus routes will be. And this is like huge impact, right? Like it's how people go about their lives and get to work every day. 
Or like, for example, there'll be like subsidies for, um, there'll be like, I think one part we were considering subsidies for like, I think like single mothers or something like that, like an education subsidy for single mothers. Um, And we wanted to, one of the things we found was that like, yeah, actually we didn't really have good data. Like what was the profile of these people? Like, you know, how, like, like what kind of jobs were they working? Like what were the hours? Like how many kids did they have? Like, you, you, like you just didn't have access to all of that. And so you were trying to make this really important national policy where you're giving out like, again, like literally millions of dollars, but you're basing it off like sort of gut feel and like, you know, really imperfect information. Um, and so I think that's the sort of primary difference you see. Like in the government, uh, you're much more constrained, but the targets you're hitting, I think are like a lot, a lot more impactful, if that makes sense. It was really interesting what you just mentioned about not having the data for this government rollout because in my mind i always thought governments were amazing at collecting data but maybe not using the data (laughs) so it's interesting the government does collect a lot of data technically um but it's all very inaccessible even to the government agencies themselves so when they say the government collects data it's, it's nice to imagine that like you know uh it's easy to imagine like there's this like you know big room full of servers somewhere and all the data that we collect from all our different services get compiled into this like you know, mega data data center and that we can just query and call all of it. That's that's not the case at all. Like, don't get me wrong. There are a couple of databases that the government uses for some stuff that are operational. But for the vast majority of situations, when the government collects your data, what happens is that like some government officer gets the form on his table. He opens up Excel and he like types in what you have on the form into his Excel spreadsheet. And he doesn't, he doesn't take that Excel and like, you know, push it into a database. That Excel file is the source of truth for like, for example, like all the people who are getting scholarships that year or like, you know, or, or like what the parking, uh, what the parking fines are for this particular area. Like it's just, it's not living in like the cloud or the central service. It's just someone's file on someone's desktop. And like, yeah, it's, it's just whatever the guy typed up. So, so, you know, for his purposes, for the guys executing, doing that work, you know, he can use this. But like if someone else somewhere across the government wants to like maybe find this out, you don't even know if this exists and you sort of have to ask around and like, you know, God, you know, someone does this, someone who does that. And then you have to get clearance to whether or not you can access it because like different government agencies don't have free access to each other's information. And in fact, you know, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of like, sort of like regulations on like what you can or can't share. And even outside of regulations, people are a little cagey about like, oh, you know, what are you going to do with this? Um, so yeah, like it's, it's non, it's non-trivial. I would say data sharing and within the government is like probably one of the biggest challenges we have. So it's, with these challenges that you're talking about, well, at least here in Silicon Valley, kind of the, I don't want to say the career path for many, but at least for some, it's work at one of the fang companies, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, whatever, and then branch off and do your own startup where you went the exact opposite. Instead of this <laughs> free environment to just create, it was, okay, now kind of pigeon toed. We don't have access to data. We might have access. What are we doing here? Who do we report to? We have 10 levels of, of sending documents. Why go that route? Why not do your own startup? The reason I went back at all was because I was a government scholar. And so I had to, you know, I had to go back and work in the government for a few years. But my original plan, you're absolutely right, was, you know, go back to Singapore, work there for a couple of years, um, you know, quit and then go back to the private sector, you know, either go back to Google or like maybe do a startup with some of my friends or something like that. That was the original plan. Um, I guess the question is more like why I stayed. Cause it's been like almost 10 years now. I'm still hanging around like well beyond my, my initial, my initial planning norm. And basically what, I don't know, like over the last like decade or so, I, I've slowly come to the conclusion that like you can't substitute government uh, like you can't substitute government with like private sector like i mean you can a little bit but like this is always this idea you know especially in the valley this is idea people want to make impact they want to go and 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 they sort of tell themselves that like oh yeah you know you can make impact from the government and from the private sector and it's true to some degree um but you've seen this over and over again when you look at different cities right and you have different cities where like you know you have a lot of like in san francisco you look at like new york um and there'll be like all this money there and like a lot of intelligence a lot of creativity a lot of drive just like tons of that but if the government doesn't function the city doesn't function right and it doesn't matter how rich people are it doesn't matter like how many billions of dollars are running around um just yeah if the government doesn't function the city just goes to hell pretty quickly yeah. um and but when the government has the when, when the government does manage to sort of get their shit together 
um, things can improve really, really fast. And you've still seen that in a lot of places. And, and that's sort of, I guess, where I'm at, which I, I've sort of come to the opinion that like, if you're trying to make sort of, you know, if you're looking at the world, right, and, you know, uh, we have like a ton of innovation for like, you know, VR stuff and like ordering stuff online and like be having like virtual assistants and all that good stuff. But if you're looking at like really just like baseline, like uh, human development indicators in developed countries, right? Like education levels, like access to justice, like access to healthcare, things like that. These are the areas where there's like very, very, very little innovation. It, it, and, it, and it barely improves. Um, and so if, does it really matter if like, you know, you, you, you know there, there's a better way of watching movies now versus like if our like childhood development indicators aren't improving? Um, so my theory essentially is that the only way to dramatically improve human society is to improve how our governments run. And the only way to dramatically improve how our governments run is through technology. That's, um, yeah, like, like you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna have like, you know, we've been doing sort of like, you know, de democracy now for you know, a couple hundred years across the world. And no one's going to come up with like a dramatically new way for writing papers and passing, you know, legislation that's going to change. Out. Like this is about the feel of what you get to. The thing that you can do is like by automating stuff, by streamlining stuff, by like, you know, getting rid of all the paperwork and that can dramatically improve the efficiency of government. But you're not going to get there if you don't use computers. Um, and so that's sort of why I stuck around. I think that, that my, my, the measure in my mind is that like, you know, if, you're, if, you, ask yourself, if you ask yourself the question of like, how can you have the most positive impact on the world given, you know, my particular set of skills and circumstances? Um, the answer seems to be, well, help the government figure out how to use computers. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. So going back to you're a government scholar. Yeah. Here in the States, I mean, I don't think we pretty much grasp what that is. Could you talk about that? And I'm also curious on that if after you graduate, you work, you have to come back. Does that mean that the Singapore government's taken the brightest, brightest, best students? Does that mean that they're working in the government instead of starting their own companies? How does the government scholar affect kind of the economics of Singapore? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the way to think about it is like, it's just moving recruiting, like, like early recruiting to its like logical conclusion. Um, I don't know I, if I'm understanding this right nowadays, like companies, when they're interviewing stuff so to hire, they, they push it. Like it's not even like senior year. It's not even junior. Year, it's like the start of junior year. You already start interviewing to hire. Um, in Singapore, what happens is that, um, after high school, like, you know, you get your grades in Singapore, we do the A levels basically. Um, and if you have good grades, you can apply for scholarships. Um, there's, and uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different scholarships, right? And the scholarships um, are from like, you know, there's from the government as a whole. And then there's like particular government agencies and even like some of the companies like, you know, like the banks or like the airlines, sometimes some of them offer scholarships. And the deal is essentially that, all right, you apply. And if you're a good student and we think you'd pass the interview and you're, you're a good match, um, the scholarship provider, and most of the time in this case, the government, they will pay for you to go to college and, you know, for Singaporeans going to college in the States is a very expensive affair. Um, uh, but in exchange after graduation, you have to come back and work for them for like X number of years, anywhere between four to eight, uh, not the average is six basically. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and that's the deal. Um, so what happens is you're right. Like if, if, if among the sort of like top students, generally speaking, your paths, are you go to med school, um, you go to law school, um, you become a government scholar or you go into like banking or finance or something like that. That's, that's generally like the paths that you go into. Um, so it does like, lim it, 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 there is some amount of substitution, I would say. And not every, and, not, and, and like, I, it's not the majority of people who take scholarships, but like a good chunk of them do. How does that affect like the market? Like I, I, I never really thought about it in that way, but like, you're right. It, it, we don't have that much entrepreneurship in uh, like, at least up until recently in Singapore, like we traditionally didn't have that much entrepreneurship from people coming out of school. Um, and that might be because of that. I, or it could be the other way around that people aren't the entrepreneurial to begin with and therefore they take this a more safe path. I'm a bit hard to tell, but you're, you're, you're right. It does, it, does, it does have that effect. Um, actually, there is a fairly large sort of like fall off rate. And so like the government gives out a lot of scholarships and after the bond ends, you know, some people like me hang around um, and, you know, and, but for a lot of people, you know, they, they, they go back to the private sector and some people go back even earlier. So you know, people who are government scholars, they go on to, you know, they, they, they go back to work in like in, 
for my friends, at least some of them go to investment banking. Some have gone to like consulting. Some have gone to do startups. Some went to like do, I think you know, some, some go to do like design agencies or things like that. They really just go all over the place. I mean, you're a fairly educated, you know, a capable person. You can, you can do a lot of things. Um, so I think it probably has some effect on the just out of school demographic, but I don't think it has a larger effect. I mean, like, after, like 10 years out, basically, I think it's kind of, it's kind of like whittled down. And, and we don't have to go in too much detail, but you did mention the startup scene. What is the startup scene like in Singapore? I think 10 years ago when I first got back or so, like it wasn't very vibrant at all. Like, you know, it was, people were still just, I, I think maybe it made the best, maybe the best, thing, the best way I can illustrate this is that um, 10 years ago, um, in order to get into computer science in Singapore and the National University of Singapore, it wasn't too hard. You needed like B's and C's, like, you know, most people could get in if you wanted to you know, do the course. Um, as of, I would say three years ago, in order to get into computer science, you need straight A's and not just straight A's, but like, like it is harder to get into than medicine, apparently. Um, so like there's been like a dramatic shift in the amount of interest in doing like, you know, programming and engineering and like software development. Um, and commensurately, as you can imagine, there's a lot more people graduating with a whole bunch of ideas and a whole bunch of things they want to do because it's a really soft hot area. Um, the government has done a few things to make it a bit like to sort of enable it. So they, they've sort of designated some like, you know, so, some of some areas just like kind of incubator areas and given a couple of grants. So there's a bunch of companies there now. Um, and I think a couple of the VCs from the Valley have like, sort of like started moving over and like, you know, started small funds there. Um, so I think it's starting to be pretty vibrant. My understanding is that like the crypto scene is pretty vibrant, though I don't know how much that is true anymore. Um, but yeah, there's a, I would say one of the interesting things is that the startups in Singapore, um, they tend, they like, they, they maybe start up in Singapore, but they eventually all try to branch out outside of the, outside of the country because Singapore is only like five or 6 million people. Like there's only so large a market. Um, and so they try to internationalize at some point. Um, but yeah, like there's, a, there's, there's quite a few VCs, there's quite a few angel investors now. I mean, people seem, especially I think recently with the world going the way it is, um, quite a lot of people are coming to Singapore because it's seen as sort of like a pretty safe hub for you, know, for you to branch out and do things. And like, you know, everyone speaks English, so it's quite comfortable for both you know, Western and Asian audiences to, uh, to come together. Um, but yeah, I think it's going reasonably well. All right, now let's pivot back to the government. Of course. So, I mean, it, at Google, at these companies, you have your KPIs, mm. you know? get this done by this date. Now, for the government, how are efficiencies or inefficiencies measured? <laughs> I wish I could say uh, they were done very well. We do measure efficiency and inefficiencies, but it's a very, I would say it's nowhere near as sophisticated as I think we could be doing. Um, so the government does use, I mean, like a lot of places have KPIs, the government has KPIs, um, but KPIs as a system is not, sort of a magic bullet, right? Like it matters what the KPIs are. And often when it comes to government goals, KPIs, like setting good KPIs is really, really, really hard um, because it's very, very easy to over-optimize for KPIs given as broad a thing as public good, right? So if you're working in a private company, you know, your KPI is revenue or number of users because that's the money you make. Whereas if you're trying to like build community, for example, right? Let's say you, let's say you are, um, let's say you, you, you're part of the community development council and, you're and your job is to like, build community in Singapore. What's a KPI? Um, so one example is you can have a KPI for like number of people attending your events, which is great, but actually you can imagine how that backfires, right? Like it means that like uh, a lot of the community centers don't have like loitering spaces. They are just basically like big halls where you organize events and you book rooms, but it's not a natural center for community necessarily. Um, another KPI you could imagine having is like, you know, let's, let's say a uh, number of downloads uh, for, for a particular app. Um, which again, for a, for a private company is like, great, people are downloading an app and using it. Uh, whereas for a government agency, you're like, well, this is taxpayer money. We're like basically spending their own money and getting them to download an app, which they themselves are paying for, but may not, may not get that much use out of. Is that really useful? Like, you know, um, and so, you know, once you get into some sort of the like broader goals, like access to justice, they like set, I think one of the, that's one of the major difficulties. Um, I think that is probably one of the biggest problems you have, you, you'll find in government, like where we, la we, we haven't set up as robust uh, sort of instrumentation infrastructure as I think we should have. Um, so, so right now, the, the government works in a very traditional fashion, right? Where it's very soft top down and the way you know, leadership hears about, you know, gets information about the world is through reports. 
And so you'll have, you know, you'll have you'll have the ground staff sort of like compile a whole bunch of stuff and they'll like clear it through the the, the the directors and directors will clear it through like the senior civil service leadership who will then staff it to the minister. Um and by the time they hear about it, it's it's like a couple months late even. Uh, and and like often missing a lot of detail. So I do think like one of the things we should be doing a lot more is, for example, having it like, you know, like, like having an easy way for the minister to know like a quick summary of what the questions people are asking, which we don't have right now. Um, efficiency is measured in terms of, they do measure efficiency in terms of benchmarking. Um, so if you have a very clear, like, you know, if you buy like, you know, standard government procedure, you have to ask for three quotes and all that. And if like you're buying, you know, if you're buying a bicycle and the bicycle is way more expensive than what the bicycle should cost, like that just gets flagged out by the auditors and things like that. But it's it, it it's reasonably okay at handling line item efficiencies of like over and undercharging. It's not that good at handling sort of like more macro scale inefficiencies where like the structure of the project is wrong or like actually this could be achieved in a much simpler way if we took a different strategy. So which is expected. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a bit hard of a question to answer. But um, the short answer is uh, we try our we, we try. We're not doing it anywhere as much as we could be doing. Um, and it sort of works to catch like really simple stuff, but it, but it allows for like, I guess, much more sort of large scale inefficiencies to occur rather than small scale ones. Now you're talking about large scale, small scales, inefficiencies. For the government, are efficiencies linear or logarithmic? Yeah, so there's something I've been thinking about. Like, I realized that efficiencies are like, yeah, like logarithmic slash exponential, depending on which way you're looking at it. Um, because you realize how much of the government like depends on each other. Like and, and no surprise, right? The government is very, very interlinked. And so someone's work depends on someone else's work, which depends on someone else's work and depends on someone else's work. And so it's not like, you know, and when something's inefficient, you're not saying like, oh, you're losing 20, 30% more efficiency if you, if you were to streamline this. Like every person who is like slow is a multiplier. And so like if, if everyone is like half as efficient, um, then that's not like everyone, it's, it's not 50% overall. It's half times half times half times half. Uh, and so you like you know your your productivity drops very 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 quickly, um, and, and and so I know Singapore generally speaking has a bit of a reputation that the government works pretty well. And I, don't get me wrong, I mean, by and large it more or less functions. But you are sort of seeing that like oh, like there's so much more potential that it could have. Um, like a lot of the efficiency is like you know you, you realize that you can have teams, you can have arbitrarily large teams do arbitrarily little, and this is just true across like any organization, not just the government, not just Singapore. Um, and so, you know, you, you've sort of seen this all the time, right? Where like, you have these like big incumbent companies and they're trying to build an app and they can't do it with like teams of 200 people. But then these like two kids out of Stanford or something like put together something that like looks and works really, really great. And that's sort of like the conclusion I've come to that like a lot of the times it's you're, tr you're, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to make sure that you have just enough parts so that all the necessary components are connected but not so many parts that you have like dead weight between the components and like just passing messages back and forth. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. It, it makes sense. But I, then I have to bring up the question of how does one go about doing that in the government when everyone gets either voted in or kind of <laughs> placed into these positions where you're like, oh, great. If we only got rid of these four steps, we'd be so much more efficient. Yeah, yeah. So so the, the theory I've come to this is like uh, you, you have to... I started thinking about uh, organizations as like Rube Goldberg machines. I don't know if you're familiar with what a Rube Goldberg machine is. Tell our audience. Uh, basically, like, I don't know if you've seen those like videos or comics where like, you know, some guy rolls a marble and a rubble, like knocks over a domino and a domino, like, you know, switches a light switch, which like turns on the fan and like does up. And at the end of the day, it does like this really, really like fantastic, complicated affairs. And the end of the day, like, you know, it turns on a TV or like opens a door or something, right? I watch a lot of YouTube reviews. <laughs> yeah, parts. really fascinating. But, but there's a few properties associated with that. One is that you can make an arbitrarily simple task arbitrarily complicated. And not just arbitrarily complicated, you can make it arbitrarily complicated while every component of that being, being critical. So every step in those machines that you watch, every step, if you took away the marble, if you took away the light switch, the whole thing would just stop working. So it seems like everything is critical. And not just critical, but like, do you get arbitrarily specialized, you can get arbitrary like specialized tasks just to get things from A to B, you know? Like, and when you think of an organization, this can happen with people too, where like person A passes, person B passes, person C, and so on and so forth. And if you just, if you just look at it from a, from a, from a, at a micro perspective, 
oh, is this person doing a job that's necessary? Yes. Is this person doing a job necessary? Yes. So piece by piece, everything looks critical and important, but you know, again, that the whole thing isn't efficient. So optimization requires a larger scale restructuring rather than, uh, rather than sort of like micro changes. And I think that's the bit of the harder part. So like, let's say, you know, can taking the physical analogy of the actual machine, right? Let's say you have this fantastic thing that opens the door. Well, can you draw a straight line from like, you know, the marble rolling down to opening the door just far more quickly? And you probably could, um, but you can't do so by like gradually perturbing the machine. You need to take an alternate strategy where you're like, you're basically building a bypass and then you deprecate and then like once the bypass is up and running, you know, you maybe still leave the old machine to open the door for most cases. And but once you know the bypass is a bit more reliable, then slowly you start using the old, you know, old, more expensive machine less and less. And then you move more resources over to the bypass and make that the primary way by which it operates. Um, and I think this is this is what happens naturally over time, you know, just through a sort of evolution, like not so much evolution, but like from a from a like almost geological process. Like if you have random perturbation in the organization and people like latch on to positions here and there and they go here and then. There's, there's this like, you know, there's this continual stream of, you know, efficiency where people who aren't, you know, where job where roles which aren't uh, doing anything useful get deprecated and rationalized. You end up with like the persistent structures being these long chains, which are all critical, but cannot be, but cannot be perturbed at a micro level. It requires a larger scale active, active construction in order to, um, in order to bypass. So I got a lot of questions that I want to dive deeper into the government, but even before that, We've been kind of bashing it. I want <laughs> maybe a good thing. Is there any takeaways that maybe the private sector could get from government? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. I mean, like, you know, I, I spend all day in government, so my head is pretty much about like how much, how, how things could be better. Uh, but I'm, I'm clearly still here. So there's a lot of stuff that it's clearly something worth doing. I, I think that's, that's the thing that I, I've realized. It's like, it, it gives you a sense of a, a much better order of magnitude about what's worth working on um just to, just just to give you a, a, a like okay very very simple sense right? everyone knows about like you know infant mortality and childhood education and all that kind of stuff and sure i mean i don't need to sell you on like why that's important but like just from a very simple administrative efficiency perspective right um everyone knows the government has a lot of paper right it's got a lot of like a lot of paper forms and a lot of things you need to fill in and it's just all over the place um, one of the tools that we built was uh, a form, like a digital form building tool. And like, again, it's, it's a bit like Google Forms, but like, you know, it's built specifically for the government. Um, it does some encryption stuff that makes it a bit, you know, makes it acceptable for government officers to use and things like that. That form has, I mean, we've got about 150,000 forms on the platform right now, which again, compared to, you know, private companies doesn't seem like a lot. But once you, but once you realize that like before this, to make a government form, to make a digital form for the government, you know, in the, in the traditional way where, you know, you gather requirements, hired a vendor, put it together, use a tested. It took like, you know, maybe three months at very least and probably at least like 50 to like $100,000. Let's say 100000 just for simplicity's sake, right? Now, so if I've got 150,000 forms on my platform and each of those forms would have cost like, you know, $100,000 to begin with. That ends up being like, what, $15 billion worth of forms? Um, and not to say that that's, we would have actually spent that. But that's to just show that like, without a tool like this, this dream of like going paperless in the government was just not achievable because no one would have spent $15 billion to build you know, 150,000 like, digital, you know, digital forms. They would have just been like, oh, digitalization is hard and then not done it. Um, similarly, like if you look at websites, right? Like, like, you know, for, for, for like the websites that people access for the government, um, like uh, during the last uh, during the last year, you know, Singapore, as, as most countries, we are sort of moving out from this like lockdown, like kind of like you know closed down scenario to like a more open, like you know, you know, people can if they're sick from from COVID, they just stay at home kind of scenario. Um, and obviously, a lot of the requirements changed, right? A lot of requirements changed, like a lot of the regulations changed, and people were confused as to what the instructions were, and and you know, people are rightly scared that if they don't follow the new, like if they follow the old instructions. Uh, it, it, or the new instructions, they might get in trouble one way or the other. Um, and so with government, traditionally, all this, this happens because government has like, there's 10,000 different, you know, well, not 10, but there's like 100 different agencies, quite literally almost, and all, with, all of them have their own sort of like different measures. And they're all, some put it on press releases, some post it like on the website, some like release a circular or something like that. Um, and just by like compiling all the information into one place and having it just on one website where people could read, that like dramatically simplifies like people's understanding of things because 
and it's not the kind of thing where you're going to make like a ton of revenue from a go, but like, it's the kind of thing where people like were really, really stressed out and like scared and frustrated before because, you know, they both have to deal with the pandemic and like the fear of government sort of like, you know, of, of like getting fined for not doing, uh, for, for, for breaking some regulation. But now they're just like, oh, okay, it's laid out here very clearly in one place. I can just sort of move on with my life. Um, and that's kind of what I think helps this, like the sort of like, at least for myself coming from the private sector, that, that's what I learned that was very different. Like, like there are these problems which, you know, it, when, when, you're in, when you're in tech, you know, and you're, let's say, working at like, you know, Netflix or like, you know, or YouTube or whatever, you know, increasing viewership of like videos by like 30% is just like crazy, like billion dollar goal. Like if you can increase, if you're working at YouTube and you've got people to watch 30% more YouTube videos, that's like multiple billions of dollars worth of revenue. But from a societal perspective, people watching 30% more YouTube is kind of like a meh. It's like, all right, I mean, what does that, that doesn't do anything for us, you know? Um, and so I think that's the biggest takeaway, that it, it, it dramatically recalibrates your sense about what impactful problems are. Okay, then, then dive in deeper in that, the impact of problems. I guess, kind of two questions. One, what do the different branches of the government or different groups, say there's 100 groups, but say there's one where it's, we're here to have more affordable housing and then this group over here is more environmental friendly, no more new buildings, and they clash or how, how does the overall look at when we implement this, how it's going to affect the local culture in the decision? So, I mean, either that kind of broad. Um, so th there's a few, there's two ways you can address this. Like the first one is just the cop out answer, which is that like, you don't bother dealing, dealing with that stuff first. My personal opinion from looking at how government operates, even in Singapore, uh, where we're supposedly efficient is that there are so many gains to be made just from like streamlining efficiency that like, are just, they're just free wins. You know, like, like if I can get your application times down from like three months down to like a day, you know, and for me to get back to you, that's, that's a win. If I can like get data in so that like I'm not like, you know, I, I'm not wasting time building houses that uh, that actually no one had any demand for, that's a win. Um, and like there are all these things which are just straight up like, you know, for that, that in tech in the tech world are obvious, right? Which is that, you know, you track your metrics, you track your users, you, you, you know, you, you A-B test, you do all this stuff. And you can get a lot of that done even before you talk about any kind of like, you know, opposing goals uh, kind of objectives. And, and that's, I think, if nothing else and you're not sure what to do, like, Tons of stuff to do there, um, but that being said, you're right. Like there are some goals which you know do conflict with each other, and that's where you need to sort of appeal to what the underlying like underlying objective is. Um, so, for example, uh, when we were trying to build uh, some of the some of the COVID systems in the last year, right? You know, you know, it, it's everyone who works in tech knows this, right? Everyone wants everything fast, secure, reliable, like scalable, like all all within a all within a short period of time. You can't get all of it. Um, and so we were having some discussions because our team, which was building a product, we were told to get it up as quickly as possible. But the but the cybersecurity agency, which is the you know the agency that handles Singapore cybersecurity as a whole, was like, no, 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 we're required to like do pen testing on this. You know, the minister said it's really important. This is a critical system. We have to like put it through all these paces. And we were like, yeah, but the same minister told us to get it up quickly. So like, you know, what are we going to do here? And the short answer is that well, you you just have to realize that the goals that you are individually given are subsets of a broader goal. And then like, once you recognize that you escalate accordingly, um, there's always going to be some judgment call that you have to make, like, cause what is a good and just society is not something everyone agrees on. But actually I think a lot more than you think is like from a common sense perspective sorted out. Right. And so you, we, we, what, what we did then was they basically we'd be like, all right, given that we know that this is the case that, you know, we've been asked to do these two opposing things in this scenario, and it's reasonable, right? The minister should ask the security agents to make sure it's secure, and he should ask us who are building it to build it quickly. Um, you just sort of say, okay, we think that this is a reasonable measure between security and speed, and we just escalate them being like, is this a reasonable trade-off to you? Okay, and then we move on from there. Um, so it's sort of this idea of like axiomatic, ex um, axiomatic escalation. Um, where every goal that you have is actually a representation of a more fundamental goal. And like, you know, at some point you run out of, you know, your, your, your mental model is unable to go, but you can escalate at least a couple of steps up in order to find out what your common goals are. Okay. And, and for a U.S. company, whether it's startup or big company that's thinking of entering Singapore, any tips, tricks, or what should they know? <laughs> I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so if you're trying to enter... 
if you're trying to enter the Singapore market, I mean, Singapore is like mostly English speaking and stuff. And so it's not too different. Like Singaporeans are quite happy to use, uh, you know, quite happy to use like sort of, you know, American uh, web services and things like that. Um, I would say the main like thing is like, you know, if you're trying to recruit and if you're trying to build in Singapore, I would say that your, a lot of the, a lot of the environment in Singapore is a lot more flexible for people to move in and out. And so like that, I think that's, I mean, this is, this is the sales pitch that I guess, uh, <laughs> some, not myself, but some of the, some of the other, but for, for you know, the, the agencies who are responsible for this gift. But the idea is that like, it's a lot easier to bring people from different countries into one place in Singapore because our immigration is actually fairly flexible as for, for, for skilled workers. Um, and like, if you want to bring people from like Europe and the U S and like China and like Indonesia all to work in one place, like it's a pretty good place to do it. Um, I would say the main thing that you'll have to recognize though, is that Singapore, the market as a whole is pretty small and you need to recognize that Singapore is very different culturally and market wise from the surrounding regions. So you, you don't come to Singapore because you expect like the Singapore market will be representative of Malaysia or Indonesia or the Philippines. Cause it's really not, they speak different languages, different backgrounds, different culture, different expectations entirely, but it is a sort of good home base where you can set up shop and then you can go work on these various areas, knowing that they will require some degree of like, sort of like, um, spe like specialization in order to, in order to crack particularly well. Okay. And then before wrapping it up, what technology that's happening in Singapore right now is really exciting to you. What technology is happening in Singapore right now that's really exciting to you? Um, or, or renovation of smart cities. What, what's being implemented that you're like, oh, this is nice? Um, I mean, I can tell you a couple of things that we're working on together with some of the government, other government agencies and that I'm really excited about. Um, so the first one is uh, we're, working on, we're working on Scam Shield. Uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's, not, it's not so much a product that is a sort of like, it's an initiative to like try and protect people from scams because what we've realized is that in the past two years, especially the number of scams has gone up just tremendously. These are phone, email, like SMS scams and things like that. And like so much so that it's like, it's almost half of all crime, I think, are like these digital scams where people get lose money to you know, some guy basically um, e either like swindling them and somehow like convincing them that they're some, like they're, they're from the police and they need some money or whatever. Um, and so like, there's like one thing we're doing there is we're trying to create, we're trying to create this system where if you, if you think about scams as like, uh, as exploiting vulnerabilities in human psyches, um, it's sort of similar to how like viruses exploit vulnerabilities in like, bio, in like cells, right? Um, but the reason why your body doesn't just like keel over and die is because when a body is exposed to a virus, it remembers what that looks like. And then it has an immune response for the whole system. So that, you know, if you got sick in your left arm, your right arm doesn't, you know, doesn't need to relearn the same, the same, um, the same lesson. And so we're trying to build a system where we can build a sort of national database of what these various attacks are and like make that be aware of the national consciousness as a whole. And so the idea is that we build a reporting system. And so if you, people are getting these like spam messages or scam messages or whatever, they can report it in um, and then we can classify them and we can publish this out. And some people will still get scammed here and there, but if it starts to pick up, like there's a pretty large attack and people going out, we can then like send out an alert or a circular, or we can like even take drastic measures to like, for example, block bank, bank transfers to this particular country for like the next day or something just to just to like stop people from losing their life savings um and that's the idea the idea is that you know if one or two singaporeans get scammed that intelligence should be saved for the country as a whole and so you have this like kind of like you know protection shield and it's not like it's not the only solution obviously as, as anyone who works in this space knows it's continuously adversarial but that's like one of the main that, that's something I'm, I'm pretty interested in because like it, it's a big deal like people lose Literally, like, they, like, you know, you have these, like, really sad stories of these, like, 70-year-old retirees who just, like, you know, in one phone call lose their life savings. And, like, it's terrible because now they, what, they have no money to, like, live out the rest of their, like, lives. Um, the other big thing I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about is uh, we're working on, we're working on, uh, the, the, the system that I told you earlier is called Redeem SG, right? Like, it's a coupon system for the government to give digital coupons. And digital coupons on their own are, like, you know, it's, it's, an, it's neat, you know, I, instead of giving out paper, I give out digital coupons. But actually, like, that's not the most interesting part to me. The most interesting part to me is that if you get this working right, it lets you shift from doing like sort of very large scale fiscal policy, which is how governments traditionally do. You know, there's a big bill and whatever, and they distribute like, you know, X, you know, like thousands of dollars to every, every American or Singaporean or whatever. Um, but this happens on like, like year scale basis. If you have a system set up, imagine if you had a system set up where like a government, where like, you know, the government leadership could say like, I want to give uh, $50 to all 
um, to all single mothers who have more than four children living in this district, and they can only spend it at supermarkets and like, I don't know, like coffee shops or something like that, right? Um, it lets you basically, like, you know, basically if you have a system like this set up, you essentially can now conduct like micro fiscal policy, right? And where, where the government can just sort of arbitrarily be like, okay, this demographic is doing poorly. Like, you, and so instead of conducting fiscal policy right now, which is very broad and crude, you can have the broad sort of measure and then you can realize like, oh no, we missed out like, you know, uh, teachers living in this neighborhood um, are actually like, actually have it worse than this sort of thing. And like this business in this neighborhood, like for example, stationary stores have it worse. And so you can then within like a day, like, you know, if you have the funds ready, Within a day, like basically, give a give a uh, give a give a give a coupon for like a a fifty dollar coupon to teachers living in this district uh, to spend at stationery stores and you know uh, hairstylists or something like that, depending on who you like, which businesses you think need help. Um, and that actually dramatically opens up an entire like avenue of possible like fiscal interventions just never happened before. Like you now can just you know if you if you ha- if you get this set up, you could have a world where like you know the government doesn't need to like announce these massive like you know hundreds of millions or billions of dollars payouts they just like go do a broad one and then they just micro tune for all the different demographics and so you never have a situation where like some person just like some group of people falls through the crack and you just like oh well it's too late we've already passed the policy you can then adjust accordingly which improves responsiveness and dramatically can change how government runs um so that's what that's one of the things i'm pretty excited about oh, that's fantastic and hong yi anyone wants to find out more fresh about you what you're working on Singapore, what's the best way to go about finding some information? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you can check out our website. It's open.gov.sg. Um, we basically like try to write everything about ourselves there because, you know, it's how we introduce ourselves to the world. Um, yeah. And, uh, like if you want to reach out to us, just like ping us. I think we have like hello at open.gov.sg or something like that. I, I believe that is correct. Uh, and, you know, just we're more than like, you know, if, you're, if, if you, if you want to hear about us or like hear about what we do, or generally, just reach out to us. We're more than happy to chat. Fantastic. We're going to have that information in the show notes. So for all our listeners, please go to our website, the Silicon Valley podcast.com, which is going to have all this information and check us out on iTunes, Spotify. We're on every major platform and we release the YouTube video shortly after the audio goes live. And for our, our audience out there, uh, Hong Yi mentioned he had a couple of his buddies going to investment banking. Well, well, I'm not doing the podcast. I'm an investment banker here in Silicon Valley. If your company is looking to get acquired, looking to acquire other companies, raise growth capital, connect with me on LinkedIn or you know find me on our website. I'd love to have a conversation. And with that, Hongi, I want to thank you for your time today on the Silicon Valley podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much.